Hi guys, welcome back to A Case of Econ Struggles. Today we're talking about the first order conditions for the neoclassical growth model. We're going to review the setup, then we're going to set up both the firm and the household problem and think about the first order conditions that characterize the solution to the neoclassical growth model. First, let's go ahead and talk about the setup. Let's review the setup. The mental picture we have in our head for the neoclassical growth model is we have Bill. Bill lives forever and knows everything. Bill owns his own firm, he owns his own labor, and he owns coconut trees that he rents out to the firm. Bill likes both eating coconuts and sitting at home or at leisure. Every period, Bill can invest in new coconut trees by planting coconuts, and he can also replace the delta amount of coconut trees that die every period through depreciation. And Bill only has a full day to either work or sit on the couch. Bill's firm doesn't own anything. If it wants to produce coconuts, it needs to rent coconut trees and it needs to hire labor. It only cares about the profit that it makes from producing and selling those coconuts. It's gonna pay its workers and its capital a wage and a rental rate. We're gonna say that the production function for this firm is gonna be decreasing in terms to scale. So for example, it might be something like this Cobb Douglas production function where the number of coconuts is equal to some parameter A times L to the alpha, K to the beta, where alpha plus beta is less than one. Here's a further simplification of that information where Bill sends his labor and his capital to Bill's firm and in return gets paid a wage, a rental rate, and any profit. He can invest in himself and he can give himself leisure by not working. Now, the definition of the neoclassical growth model equilibrium, we know it's an allocation given prices that is optimal and satisfies market clearing. That's from just any generic competitive equilibrium definition. So here it is, Bill gets to choose his consumption, his labor and his investment every period. Given the prices, which are wages and the rental rate in every period, it's got to solve Bill's utility maximization problem with all those lovely budget constraints and time constraints. It also needs to solve Bill's firm's profit maximization problem. And it needs to ensure market clearing. There are three markets in this world, the labor market, the capital market, and the goods market, as you see here. So as we go through and we solve for these first order conditions from the consumer problem and the firm problem, we need to keep in mind that the conditions that characterize the neoclassical growth model equilibrium do need to include these three market clearing conditions. So let's start off with the firm first order conditions, then we'll move on to the household problem, and then we will be done. So the firm problem, like we said before, is this profit maximization problem. There are no constraints based on the way it's been written. We can take the first order condition with respect to labor and capital. We know from our micro days that the wage and the rental rate should be equal to the marginal product of labor and the marginal product of capital respectively. So the marginal product of labor over the marginal product of capital is equal to the ratio of the wage and the rental rate. So that makes sense. That's all we are going to need out of the profit maximization problem. We also know that because it's decreasing in terms of scale, the amount of profit here is zero. So we don't have any profit to worry when we go into the household problem. Here's the household problem. You can see that we've got a bunch of constraints going on. So before I really take first order conditions, I wanna make this problem a little easier to solve. The first thing I can do to make it a little easier to solve is to note that we said that profit is zero, so I don't have to worry about this pi t in here. I also have an equation that gives me investment, and I have equation two, which has investment in it. So what I can do is I can substitute this guy into here and just make my life a little easier. Then I'm going to put that all in terms of consumption so that I can take consumption out of the problem. So I have CT equals that long thing right here that I'm gonna plug into the utility function. Now my utility function is just a function of capital and labor where this profit is really zero. Now the first order conditions are just gonna be for capital tomorrow and labor. Notice that when I take the first order condition of capital tomorrow, that means that in today's first order condition, KT plus one shows up as tomorrow's capital. And in tomorrow's part of the utility function, tomorrow's capital is today's capital. So you can see here that we have the marginal utility of stuff today and the marginal utility of stuff tomorrow all in the same first order condition. We can use that to our advantage because we know in equilibrium, most people are gonna consumption smooth if we assume that people are risk averse, which is a very common assumption that we make. So now here is that assumption being applied. The marginal utility of stuff today and the marginal utility of stuff tomorrow should be the same, so one. So that means that I can solve for R bar or the equilibrium long run real interest rate in this economy. 
which I get as one over beta minus one plus depreciation, which I know is gonna be greater than one. Now I can take the first order condition of that same problem with respect to leisure, and I'm going to get this lovely mess right here. I can cancel some betas. I know it's gonna be equal to zero because we're taking a first order condition. And this is telling me that the fraction of marginal utility of a leisure over the marginal utility of consumption is equal to the wage over one. And all that's telling me is that the trade-off between leisure and consumption is equal to wage. And that is what we call an intratemporal relationship because it's everything in the same time period. Now we are done. We have completely characterized the solution and that is as far as we're gonna go in this video. So hopefully this gives you a little better idea of how the neoclassical growth model works and how to characterize the solution to the neoclassical growth model. If it was helpful, make sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.